Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host as always, Marcus Sadu, and today we've got Nir Yal on the show. And Nir specializes in behavioral design and time management. And I thought that this would be a really cool episode for you guys because time management is just such an important aspect of looking, feeling, and performing better because we're all super busy. We've got a ton going on, but Nir has a bunch of tips for us to sort of manage our schedules better, get things done, break old habits, implement new ones in a more effective way. And he does so with a focus on technology. So I found this episode really useful for myself personally. I hope you guys do too. And now let's dig in. Nir, thanks for coming on the pod, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So for the folks who may not be familiar with your work, can you give us a bit of background on how you got into all this hooked and indistractable stuff originally? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm what you call a behavioral designer, meaning I use technology and psychology to help companies build the kind of products that build good habits in users' lives. Uh, I wrote my first book back in 2014, which was about uh, how to build habit-forming products. That book was called Hooked. And uh, the idea behind the book was to steal the secrets of companies like Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack and these company, the gaming companies that are so good at changing our behavior in order to build all kinds of products and services that can help people improve their lives with healthy habits. So for example, uh, Fitbod uses the Hooked model to get people hooked to exercising in the gym. And uh, Kahoot gets kids hooked to uh, in-classroom learning. Uh, One of my clients, the New York Times, gets people hooked to reading the news every day. So there's all kinds of ways that we can use these tactics to help people form good habits. And then more recently, I focused my attention, given my background and expertise in the area, on, well, how do we break the bad habits? And so that's what Indistractable is all about. Because what we see is the problem today, I think, is there's no longer an information gap, right? Like if you don't know how to do something, everybody's got access to Google. Like there's no excuse anymore to say, well, I just don't know what to do. It's all out there. Uh, Most of it's free. And even if we use common sense, right, who doesn't basically know how to get in shape? Who doesn't basically know that if you want to have better relationships, you have to be fully present with people? Who doesn't know that if you want to do better at your job, you have to do the work, especially the stuff that's hard that other people don't want to do. And so the question is, if we know what to do, why don't we do it? And so that's really the the core of this new book, Indistractable, which is all about how to control your attention and choose your life. Gotcha, man. Now, you were originally going to write sort of the sequel or the counterpart to Hooked called Unhooked, correct? So I'm curious why you decided to go a different route with Indistractable specifically. Yeah. So, the you know, I originally thought, um, it, you know, and let, well, let me back up a minute. So When I wrote Hooked, it wasn't so difficult to write because uh, I'd never published a book before. Um, I I had a few consulting clients, but I didn't do that much speaking or, you know, I I didn't have that much of a public facing persona and I wasn't getting that many inbound requests on my time. But then I published Hooked and it sold 250,000 copies and um, a lot of people started calling <laughs> and I got very busy all of a sudden. And I realized that the, the one thing that had made me successful, the, uh, the, the, the writing and the researching, I didn't have any time for anymore, that I kept getting distracted by all these other opportunities. And, and that was really unfortunate for me. I love writing, and it's, uh, it, it's very important for me to continue doing for my livelihood as well as just for my, my own personal well-being. And I was distracted in other areas of my life too. You know, I, when I was with my daughter, I would be distracted. When I was with my friends, I would be distracted. When I would say I was going to go to the gym, I would get distracted and I wouldn't go. And, and that really pissed me off. And so I wanted to get to the core of why this was happening. And my knee-jerk reaction was, I think what most people's knee-jerk reaction is, is that, well, you know, what, what's changed over the past few years? Well, it looks like we have these technologies. Maybe that's the source of the problem. And so I kind of did some soul searching and said, oh my God, I wrote Hooked. And now maybe I need to get unhooked. And I didn't choose to ultimately write that book because even though I started down that path, 
when I did the, 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 uh, you know, I experimented with some of these tactics and I said, okay, let's do what a lot of people say in the field. Let's, let's do a digital detox. Let's get rid of our technology for 30 days. Right. And that's what a lot of people preach these days. And I tried that. I got myself a flip phone. I got myself a word processor with no internet connection. Uh, and I finally said, okay, now I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. I'm going to do my work. I'm going to concentrate. Here I go. But let me just read that quick book I've been meaning to check out in, on my bookshelf. Maybe there's some research in there. Or uh, let, me, let me just uh, clean up my desk. Or, or, or let me just take out the trash. And I would keep getting distracted. And so what I learned was the more I researched this topic of distraction, I realized that the problem isn't the technology. The problem is distraction of all sorts. And people have been getting distracted since time immemorial. I mean, uh, uh, Plato talked about it 2,500 years before the iPhone. Plato was talking about, boy, isn't the world such a distracting place? <laughs> he called it akrasia, the tendency that we have to do things against our better interest. And if he was complaining about it 2,500 years before the iPhone, well, then I think there's something to be said around the fact that, you know, maybe it's not technology that's causing this problem. And so I, I didn't call the book Unhooked because there was nothing to get unhooked from. What we needed to understand is how we can continue to use these technologies. I love these. I don't want people to stop using Facebook if they don't want to. Uh, I don't want people to, you know, I'm not going to be one of these people that says, oh, just, you know, dump these technologies, stop using them. They're wonderful, right? And frankly, if you did stop using them, you'd probably get fired from your job. I mean, it's not practical to give people that kind of advice. These technologies, these tools are not going away. It's kind of like saying to people, you know, you're overweight, just stop eating. Well, you, you, can't stop eating. <laughs> and, and the same thing goes for technology. You can't stop using technology. I mean, it's part of the modern world. We need to learn how to use it appropriately and in a way that serves us as opposed to feeling like we are serving it. I love that message, man, because we seem to sort of love these polarizing ideas like the good, bad, right, wrong, hot, cold. And it seems like a lot of folks look at technology in the same light. So it's either, you know, sort of the best invention ever or it's rotting our brains and killing us from the inside out. So how do you sort of position or couch that tech is bad point of view and think about this stuff big picture? Yeah, so this is this is super important. So I think what we have to realize is that these things are tools and clearly, you know, let, let let's be clear, they are designed to be engaging. No doubt about it, right? The question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? Do we want to tell, hey, hey, Netflix, can you stop making your show so interesting? I want to watch them a lot. Uh, you know, uh, I, uh, Apple, can you make your phones less usable? Because I find myself wanting to use my phone a lot. It's ridiculous. We, 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 it doesn't make any sense. The, the fact that these products are made to be engaging is not a problem. That's progress, right? We want these tools to be engaging. The question is, how can we use them in such a way that we can get the best out of these tools without letting them get the best of us? So clearly they are designed to be engaging. Just like, you know, in the food industry, food is designed to be delicious. Don't we want food to be delicious? Of course we do. And so I don't want to live in a world before Facebook and the iPhone and email, and nor do I want to live in a world before chocolate cake. These things are great. <laughs> the question is, how can we learn or live in a world where we can enjoy these things, but in a way that serves us as opposed to feeling like we are slaves to these things? And, and it turns out it's not that hard that if you know what to do, if you know the, the, the methodology, the strategy behind why we get distracted in the first place, you can actually take some simple steps uh, that can help anyone become indistractable. Yeah, man, this is why I love your message so much, because it kind of puts the ball back in the in the court of the person, right? We can take ownership. We accept the fact that these things are, you know, built to distract us. But then it's up to us as far as how we use the tool. So it's not the tool itself. It's how we use it. So can we outline the four steps of your indistractable model? Absolutely. So the first step is to master the internal triggers. And so what this is about is really about understanding the root cause of why we get distracted. But be before we do that, let me explain what do I mean by distraction? What What is distraction really? Well, the best but the best way to understand what distraction is, is to understand what it is not. So the opposite of distraction, if you ask most people, what is the opposite of distraction? They'll tell you it's focus, but I don't agree. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. So both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull, and they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent. The opposite of 
of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you plan to do, things that you do not plan to do with intent. So why is this important? I would argue that, number one, anything can be a distraction. So if you sit down at your desk and say, okay, now I'm going to work on that big project. Now I'm going to do that thing I've been putting off. Here I go. I'm finally going to get started on the thing I've been procrastinating. But let me check email first. That is just as much of a distraction, right? Even though email feels worky, it feels like it's something that's productive. It feels like something that, that, that you have to do anyway. But here's the thing. That's your brain tricking you, right? That is distraction getting the best of you. Why? Because when you do that, you are prioritizing the urgent at the expense of the important. And that's toxic when it comes to personal productivity. So anything can be a distraction. And also anything can be traction as long as you plan for it. So there's nothing wrong with enjoying Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or whatever it is you want to do. These tools are great as long as you use them on your schedule, not someone else's. I mean, what, why do we all complain about how technology is melting our brains apparently and, you know, so addictive? What's any different between, you know, playing Candy Crush or going on Facebook versus watching a football game on TV? There's no difference. It's whatever you want to do with your time. As long as you're living according to your values and, and using these products on your schedule, enjoy them without guilt. And so we need to get rid of this moral hierarchy that I think is not helping anybody. So we've got traction. We've got distraction. Now, we've got, now we can start getting into the steps of how do we start tackling distraction. So to ask ourselves, what leads us towards traction and distraction? We have two things. Two things prompt us to action. We have what's called external triggers. External triggers are the pings, the dings, the rings, all of these things in our environment that can lead us towards traction or distraction. And then we have what's called the internal triggers. The internal triggers are the, the real source of distraction. In fact, most distraction, it turns out, doesn't start from outside of us, but rather starts from within. And what we need to face, the fact of the matter is that the reason we get distracted, by and large, is because we are looking to escape discomfort. If you are doing something you know you'll later regret or not doing something you know you should, the reason you are, are doing or not doing those things, the reason you got distracted is because you are looking to escape discomfort. Why? How do I know this? Because it's the reason you do everything. Everything we do, everything we do is about the desire to escape discomfort. It's called the homeostatic response. If you go outside and it's cold, that doesn't feel good, so your body says, put on a jacket. If you go back inside, now it's too hot, the body tells you to take it off. If you are hungry, your body says, oh, that, here's, here's a hunger pang, that, that does not, that's not comfortable, so you eat, and then if you eat too much, you feel stuffed, so you stop eating. So that's the homeostatic response in the body. We know the same to be true in the mind, that when we feel lonely, check Facebook. When we are feeling uncertain, Google. When we're bored, Check the news, uh, sports scores, uh, Reddit, Pinterest, you name it. All of these products and services cater to an, an uncomfortable feeling. So what does this mean? It means that if we are going to manage our time and if we acknowledge that all human behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort, well, that means that time management is pain management. And so that has to be the very first step, that if, if you're not doing what you said you would do, it's because you are looking to escape an uncomfortable sensation that you don't have the tools to cope with currently. And so the first step has to be to, to arm ourselves, to equip ourselves with the tools to make sure that when we feel that emotional discomfort, it leads us towards traction rather than distraction. Gotcha, man. So as far as establishing that, that is step number one, correct? Right. Okay, right. gotcha. So then how about step number two? So step number two, so after we master the internal triggers, and there's a bunch of ways to do that, right? So that, that the strategy is, is master the internal triggers. Then now there's tactics for actually how to do that, which we can discuss later. Of course, it's in the book as well. But the second big strategy is to make time for traction. You know, one of the things I heard across the board with people who are struggling with distraction, I interviewed hundreds of people for the book uh, over the past five years. Everyone I talked to who struggled with distraction, you know, they tell me, oh my goodness, I, I can't get anything done because, you know, my kids want that and my boss wants this. And did you hear what happened in the news and Twitter, this and that? And when I would ask them, I'd say, you know, wow, that's really tough. I'm sorry to hear that. Can I see what it was you got distracted from? You know, let me see what you plan to do that you didn't get to do. And they'd kind of look at me funny and they'd take out their phones and they'd show me their calendar and it would be full of white space, right? 
it would be full of just nothing. <laughs> it turns out two thirds of people don't keep any sort of calendar. And even the one third that do only keep some work related tasks in their calendar. But of course, our life is much more rich than just our work. That's not our only value is work tasks. So what we have to do is to turn our values into time. If you value physical fitness, right? I'm not saying that needs to be your value, but if it is, I'm guessing most of your listeners have that as one of their values. Well, is that in your schedule? If being with friends and family is important to you, is that in your schedule? If prayer, meditation, uh, learning, whatever it might be is important to you, it has to be in your schedule. Certainly when it comes to the workplace, scheduling time for email, scheduling time for reflection for, to help you do your job more effectively, that time needs to be scheduled or else it ain't going to happen. And so the fact of the matter is you cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. And if you don't plan your day, somebody's going to plan it for you, right? If you've got white space in your day, you're not going to fill it with, you know, writing that novel. <laughs> you're going to fill it with scrolling Facebook or checking the news or doing something else frivolous that you may later regret. So instead of letting these distractions, you know, take over that white space, claim that time for yourself. I mean, think about how much time we we spend protecting our stuff, right? We have alarms on our cars. We have security systems in our homes. We have our money in banks behind vaults. But when it comes to our time, ah, sure, come on, whatever, whoever needs it, come on over and take it. And so we have to protect that time by making what's called a time box calendar. I'll give you a link in the, that you can add to the show notes. I built this tool that's completely free. You don't have to sign up for anything that anyone can use to build themselves a time box calendar. So that for the first time, you'll be able to look at that calendar and say, okay, everything that I plan to do is traction. Anything that is not that is a distraction. That's what's so important about keeping one of these time box calendars. So that's step two. And then, of course, there's a lot more to it. I'm just giving you the, the 30,000 foot overview. Yeah, totally, man. That absolutely blew my mind when I heard that two thirds of people don't have a calendar because I just personally, I write everything down. I have to have my calendar. I love Picking it off, it's like super rewarding for me. You know, I just need that to set my day up. And I think what it reminds me of is, you know, the saying, show me someone's calendar and their credit card statement, and I'll show you their priorities. It's just yeah. so true. Yeah, that's what it's all about. That's that's what I mean by turn your values into time, right? I need to be able to see uh, what your values are reflected by how you spend your time. Uh, you know, we can all talk a good game. We all say, Oh yeah, totally. This is, you know, I, I want to, I, I, I'm a person who values my health. I'm a person who values my relationships. Well, well, really, <laughs> do you, do you put that time on your calendar or do you do it whenever the time is left over? Right. Do you, do you give time to your friends, to your family, to your loved ones? You know, do you give them the little scraps and increments of time or do you actually invest in those relationships as you would invest in anything that's important to you in your life? Now, do you distinguish a difference between someone's calendar and a to-do list, or how do you think or recommend that folks sort of parse that stuff out? Yeah, so to-do lists on their own are awful. Uh, they actually make the problem worse, and a lot of people do this, and I certainly used to, right? I, I used to think that if you want to get things done, you put things on a to-do list, and they magically get done. And that's not how it works, <laughs> right? Like, lo and behold, there's no magic fairy that gets everything done for you just because you put it on to-do list and said, I'm going to do all these things this, this day. And so here's my big beef with to-do lists. You know, I would keep a to-do list and uh, have 100 things on my to-do list that I said I'm going to do today. And then I'd, I'd, get, I'd have a super productive day. I'd get through 10, 15 things. I'd be super proud of myself. And then I'd look at my to-do list and I'd still have fucking, you know, 90 things to do. <laughs> and I felt like a loser day in and day out. And so this is what people do. I certainly did. You, you know what it is. If you've ever kept a, count, uh, a to do list, you've probably done this. You know, most of the things on your to do list get, get lumped into the next day and the next day and the next day. And we keep recycling these things day after day. And what you're doing when you do that is you're training yourself to believe that you're a loser, that you are ineffective at doing what you said you're going to do. And so, you don't want to do that because you're literally training yourself to accept the fact that you're a liar. You said you would do these things and you didn't. That's toxic. The re and that's why these, these to-do lists backfire. The other reason, not only do they reshape our identity and we teach ourselves that we're incapable of finishing everything we say we would do, which is the antithesis of living with personal integrity, they also don't allow you to actually relax. When you keep a big old to-do list, 
and you get to the end of your day and you still haven't done everything you needed to do, well, when you want to watch Netflix, when you want to chill out, when you want to be with your friends, when you want to hang out with your kid, you feel guilty because, oh my God, I still have all those things on my to-do list I still haven't done. So that's you know the two big reasons why I hate to-do lists on their own. Now, to-do lists as part of this system do work, but here's the missing component that most people don't understand. You have to turn those values, those things that you want to get done into time. Meaning if it's on your to-do list, it needs to have a place on your calendar. And you need to focus on the inputs, not the outputs. You know, many people on their calendar, they just put finish this, finish this, finish this. The problem is, you know, study after study have found that people are horrible at predicting how long a task will take. We're really bad at this. So what happens for most of us, we say, okay, I'm going to work on this task. Here I go. I'm working on it and I don't finish it. And I feel like I failed because I can't check that box on my to-do list. And so now what, what happens when I feel crappy? I look for more distraction to take my mind off of how crappy I feel about myself. And so don't do that. What you want to do is to say the only goal is to work on a set task for a prescribed period of time without distraction. That's your goal. So that at the end of every time block, like let's say you say, okay, I'm going to write my, that blog post for 30 minutes. I'm going to work on that presentation for 30 minutes. I'm going to go on a walk for 30 minutes, whatever it might be. I'm going to do this task without distraction. That is my only goal. Now you say, well, what if it's not enough time? Well, your schedule isn't set in stone, right? So week to week, you have time in your calendar to look at that time box calendar and revise it accordingly. So if you say to yourself, oh, you know what? I didn't get enough time to check my, all my emails, or maybe I, I put in too much time to check my emails. Well, then you adjust it in the week ahead, learning from what you did or didn't finish the week prior. But if you don't set the time to say the only goal is to work on something without distraction, chances are you won't even get to it in the first place. So that's the most important task is to, is to block out that time when you work on something without distraction so that you feel like a winner after every time block. You say, look, I did what I said I'm going to do. Now you are reinforcing this belief. You are proving to yourself that you have the agency to do what it is you say you're going to do. So because we're so poor at, you know, thinking about how much time a task is going to take, do you recommend in our calendars using time as sort of the overarching theme as opposed to completing a certain task just because we're so bad at, you know, assessing whether how long it's going to take? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's exactly right. So if, if it has a place on your to-do list, it has to have a place on your calendar. Uh, and that should be the final metric is, you know, it's, it's think about it this way. If, uh, if you go to visit a bakery and you, uh, meet with the baker and you say, Hey, I need a hundred loaves of bread. And he's going to say, okay, no problem. Uh, where's the flour? Where's the sugar? Where's the yeast? I need all the input to make the output. But somehow when it comes to knowledge workers, right, people who, who work with their minds as opposed to just working with their hands, you know, for, for, for us folks, we don't think about the input. But what is our input? Our input is time. And so we have to plan the time. That is our flour, our sugar, our yeast, our supplies is the time that goes into a task. So if you just plan the output on your to-do list, that's magical thinking. It's not going to happen. You have to plan the, the input in order for the output to happen. I love that, man. Now, I think we are at number three. So what is uh, third up on the list? Okay, so the third step is to hack back the external triggers. The external triggers are the pings, the dings, the rings, all of the things that can lead you towards traction or distraction. So, for example, you know how, how can uh, an external trigger help you? Well, if you get a notification on your phone that says, hey, now it's time to hit the gym, or now it's time for that lunch meeting, or now it's time for you to work on that big project, whatever it is that you said you were going to do in advance in your time box calendar, well, that external trigger is wonderful. It's helping you do what you wanted to do. It's leading you towards traction. But if it's not helping you do what you plan to do, if it's helping you do something else, <laughs> uh, if it's a notification from a, a, a news app or whatever, you know, some kind of uh, interruption, then that's leading you towards distraction. And, and I want to make sure it's clear here. I'm not just talking about technology. In ter it turns out that in surveys, the number one cause of distraction in the modern workplace is not your computer. It's not your phone. It's other people. Wow. The number one source of distraction is your colleagues, <laughs> especially if you work in open floor plan offices. Uh, 
And so the solution to this, there's many in the book. I talk about how do you hack back your phone? How do you hack back your computer? How do you hack back group chat? How do you hack back email? I can show you how to save up to 90% of the time you spend on email by hacking back email. Meetings, oh my God, how much time do we spend in stupid meetings that didn't need to be called? We have to hack those back. Because, you know, I and I use the term hack back um, in, in the computer hacker way and then that the, the meaning of to hack means to gain un- unauthorized access to something. So a computer hackers gaining unauthorized access. Uh, these tech companies, when it comes to you know social media, they are gaining access to your attention. And so here's the thing. We can hack back. We can change these tools. We can change these devices in a way that serves us as opposed to us feeling like we are serving them. And so I show you all different ways to prevent distraction, no matter in what form it comes It comes in terms of these external triggers, by hacking back the external triggers in all of these various contexts. Gotcha, man. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky one, but I find that, especially with my clients, just the people I've worked with one-on-one, they have no problem scheduling something. So say they have a meeting or an external lunch or something like that with someone else, they're totally fine keeping that, so their, their integrity around that meeting. But when they're scheduling yeah. something for themselves, it's a lot trickier. So do you have any tips on how to recommend working around that? Uh, it's it's so true. I mean, we do this all the time. We would never, you know, flake out in a meeting. We would never lie to a colleague or a friend or a family member, and yet we lie to ourselves all the time. Uh, partially, it's because we say, "Oh, I'll just get to it when I get to it." Right? I'm sure I'll have some time open up when I'll be able to hit the gym or you know work on that big uh, project or whatever it might be. And and the fact of the matter, it it doesn't happen without intent. And so, look, if you're if 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 someone is happy with their life this way, I'm not going to tell them to change. I'm talking to the people who this pisses off, right? That we're not happy with the fact that we say we will do one thing, that we have these goals, we have these aspirations, we know what we're capable of, and yet we don't do the things we promise to ourselves we will do. And so that's really who I'm talking to. That's who I used to be before I wrote this book. And, and that's the problem we're solving here is, is how to make sure that we can, we can live in this way with personal integrity by becoming indistractable. That's what this is all about. Gotcha, man. Now, what is number four? So number four is to prevent distraction with pacts. Uh, And this is the fourth and final step, and it has to be done in order. If you don't do these steps in order, they don't work. They backfire, in fact. So before you set that calendar, you have to know how to uh, master these internal triggers. And then before you hack back the external triggers, you have to first know what it is that you're getting distracted from in your day. So you have to follow these steps one, two, three, four in order. The fourth step, and this one is probably the most dangerous, uh, this is called making a pact or a pre-commitment. And and this has been studied for centuries, this technique. It's basically deciding in advance what we want to do uh, and preventing us from doing something we don't want to do. And so we use a pre-commitment, some kind of promise to ourselves to make sure that we don't go off track. And we make a promise either to ourselves or to someone else uh, to make sure that, that when the time comes and we are likely to get distracted, there is something preventing us from doing something we don't want to do. So there are three types of pacts. We have what's called an effort pact, a price pact, and an identity pact. An effort pact is when we put some bit of friction between us and something we don't want to do. So in my household, um, you know, we're all adults here. I can, I can talk about this, I hope. Uh, but uh, my wife and I, you know, we've been married for 18 years. And a few years ago, we noticed that our sex life was really suffering because night after night, Uh, we were going to bed later and later and she was fondling her iPad and I was caressing my iPhone (laughs) as opposed to being intimate. And that wasn't good. We were, we were lacking sleep. We were lacking intimacy. And so what do we do about it? Well, we institute, after we did the other three steps, we instituted an effort pact. So here's what I did. I went to the hardware store and I got us this outlet timer and this outlet timer plugs into to your outlet in your wall and you can plug in anything into it. It costs us like $10, very cheap. And whatever you plug into it will turn off at a certain time, uh, well, whatever time you set. So in our household, every night, 10 p.m., the internet router shuts off. Now, 
could I turn it back on? Of course I could, but I'd have to go under my desk and fiddle with the settings and unplug and replug. It's a kind of a pain, so it put a bit of effort in between me and something I didn't want to do. Today, actually, the, the routers come built in with this functionality, so you can leave the home security system on and the Amazon Alexa on and all the, the smart devices on while your computer monitor, your router, you know, the, the stuff that, or the, um, uh, your, your computer, for example, turns off and doesn't, doesn't have access to the internet. So that would be an example of an effort pack. And of course, there are many other effort packs that we can take, and I, I explain those in the book. The next type of pact is called an, uh, a, a price pact. A price pact is when there's some kind of cost, some kind of financial disincentive to not following through with what you said you would. And this actually came from the research around smoking cessation, that it turns out the most effective smoking cessation study in history, all they required was to get people to put some skin in the game. So when people put a bet up and said, if I stop smoking, sorry, they, they told the, the people in the study, you have to pay $150, and if you don't smoke for six months, as validated by a urine test, if you don't smoke for six months, you get the $150 back. That simple trick of just putting some skin in the game was the most effective smoking cessation study in history. Isn't nicotine this like crazy addictive substance that is so hard to quit and all it took was 150 bucks of people saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So it turns out we can do that in our own lives. Uh, you know, every morning when I wake up, uh, I have this calendar in my closet. It's the first thing I see when I get dressed. And on that calendar, on today's date, there is taped a hundred dollar bill. And above the calendar, there's a lighter. And so every day I have a choice to make. I call this the burn or burn technique. Every day I have a choice to make. I can either go to the gym and feel the burn or burn some calories or take a walk around the block, do some push-ups. I have to do something physical every day or burn the $100. That's my choice. And now I have to do one of those two things because that $100 bill is taped onto the calendar and I can't move it unless I have done today's task, right? To done today's uh, exercise of some kind. And let me tell you, I've done this for the past three years, and I haven't burned the money even once because I know the cost, right? It's, it's, I've instituted this price pack to keep me honest, to, keep me to, do, to get me to do what I say I'm going to do. Now, of course, I haven't burned the money because when, when push comes to shove, I say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll do the 100 push-ups or I'll stick with my calendar. I'm not going to you know, flake out if I plan to go to the gym today. I'm not going to flake out and not go because that's what I said I'm going to do. And it's a very effective technique. And to be honest, now that I've done it for three years, I actually don't even need it anymore, right? Because I've been so consistent, now I actually want to go to the gym. I enjoy these type of activities as before. I used to absolutely hate them. So instead of paying for a trainer, instead of you know paying for a program to keep me on track, I'm actually keeping myself accountable with this price pact. Uh, and then, of course, there are other techniques as well with these price packs, like making a price pact with someone else can also be very, very effective technique. And then the last technique uh, is called making an identity pact, which is probably the most effective and interesting of the three types of pre-commitments. This is when we shape our identity in a way that helps us become more likely to do what we say we're going to do. So this comes from the psychology of religion, which tells us that when people have a moniker, some kind of identity, a noun they use to call themselves, they become much more likely to do what they say they're going to do. So if you call yourself a devout Muslim, an observant Christian, even a vegetarian, you become much more likely to do or not do certain things. So a vegetarian doesn't wake up in the morning and say, hmm, I wonder if I should have some bacon. No, a vegetarian doesn't eat meat. It is who they are. And it takes a lot for them to switch that identity. So having an, a, a certain identity can really be a tool for us to become indistractable. And that's why I titled the book what I did, because now we can use this moniker. We can say, no, this is who I am. I am indistractable. I don't respond to every text message in 30 seconds. I, I'm not the kind of person who has their life and their attention uh, and their decisions controlled by somebody else. I decide for myself how I want to spend my time and my attention because I am indistractable. And the good news is we've been here before, right? I remember growing up in the early 1980s, we had ashtrays in my living room. Now, my parents didn't smoke. Why did we have ashtrays in the living room? Because back then, this is going to sound crazy if you grew up in the 90s, but in the 80s, People just came to your house and expected to smoke in your living room. They didn't care whether you smoked because they just expected to light up. 
Now that would be crazy, right? Who would do that? <laughs> that would be ter- you know, incredibly rude to just assume you could smoke in someone's living room. And so what changed? Why did we stop that behavior? Is it because of some legislation? No, there's never been a law that says you can't smoke in someone's private residence. What changed was that our norms, our manners changed. And so, you know, people started standing up and saying, hey, you know what? We are non-smokers. If you want to smoke, please go outside. And I remember when my mom first did this, she actually lost friends because of this. When she told people, we're non-smokers, if you want to smoke, go outside, people thought that was so rude of her to do. And so what we see happening is very similar to what's happening today with technology. We are spreading the message, what we call social antibodies, to, to spread this message of what is the appropriate and inappropriate time to use our various technologies. I absolutely love these three packs. So double clicking on that first one, I feel like it's so useful to almost rely on our own laziness by using these effort barriers. So for example, like what are the chances of you standing up, going under your desk, setting up the router again, or whatever you have to do in order to fire up the internet again. And I feel like even if you do do that 50% of the time, that still gives you 50% of the time where you don't, right? Right, right, exactly. And, and you know, again, it's something you do after the other three steps, right? If you haven't set your bedtime, uh, then it's not going to work, <laughs> right? If you haven't hacked back the external triggers, if you haven't mastered the internal triggers so that you know why you keep checking until, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, you have to do those things first. But if you've done those things, then this as a fail safe, as the last resort to prevent you from getting distracted can be very, very effective. But again, if you jump just to this technique, if you listen to this and you're like, oh, great, I'm going to make a pact with myself. I'm going to make a $10,000 bet that I'm never going to get distracted again it's going to fail, right? It fails with diets. It fails with any kind of distraction because you have to do the other three steps first. Okay. Gotcha. So be sure to implement the order of importance first and foremost. Mm -hmm. It's funny around the price pack thing. An ex-girlfriend of mine used to do bar classes, like these workouts. And I remember they would charge her 20 bucks if she didn't show up. And I couldn't believe how effective it was like she never missed a workout there you go there you go it's it's it can be incredibly effective to have that 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 disincentive for not showing up the the beauty is you know when when and i'm not anti doing that by the way but i ask people to consider uh, how you can do this to yourself or even ask a, lo- ask a loved one, right? So you could ask a loved one that if I don't do this thing, then I want you to take my money and give it to, you know, give it to somebody I don't like, or, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can do to have a disincentive for not showing up. But again, I can't emphasize enough. You have to do this last. <laughs> okay. After the other three things. Gotcha, man. Now I've subscribed to the idea for a while now that willpower is a finite resource and it kind of you know, can be depleted, which also Mm. might tie in with decision fatigue. But I'm pretty sure that you have a bit of a differing thought process here. Am I right? I do. Yeah. So, you know, the the book Indistractable is full of uh, me turning over apple carts. (laughs) And this is certainly one of them. Uh, This has to do with reimagining our temperament under that first section around how do we master our internal triggers. I, I, I want people in this section to consider which monikers, which which identities are serving you? Because I think a lot of the the way that we uh, we we describe ourselves, that we think about ourselves, many times can backfire, and, and in particular around our capabilities. So when people say, "Oh, I'm a morning person," or "This is my Myers Briggs," or whatever, "This is my personality type," and I can't change it. First of all, the science for most of that stuff is is pretty crappy. But but two, even if you do have particular personality traits, I don't really want to argue about that. Even if you do, I would ask us to consider, is it really serving us? So here's a great example of this. So for many years, there was this idea of what we call ego depletion, which is this idea that willpower is a finite resource, that we run out of willpower. And um, so what does that sound like? So, you know, I would do this all the time. I would come home from work and I'd say, oh, I've had such a hard day. I'm spent. I have no willpower left. How can I possibly resist? I deserve that pint of ice cream and I'm going to watch Netflix for two hours, right? Because I'm, I'm spent. I have no willpower left. And so there were a few studies that actually showed that, that maybe this is the case. But then, you know, with, as, with a lot of things in the psychology community, what we do in the scientific community, we replicate these studies. We run the studies again if they sound too good to be true. And it turns out, lo and behold, ego depletion doesn't exist. It is very doubtful that we run out of willpower like we run out of gas in a gas tank. It doesn't work that way. Except, except 
in one group of people. Turns out that one group of people really does exhibit ego depletion. They really do run out of gas in a gas t- like uh, of willpower like gas in a gas tank. And those people are people who believe that willpower is a limited resource. <laughs> so if you believe it to be true, guess what? It does become true. And so that's why we need to reconsider these, these limitations on our temperament, that we think we have some kind of fixed capabilities, that we are, that, that we are a certain way. It's a very dangerous thing. And, you know, we can use it to our advantage when we call ourselves something that helps us be better. If we call ourselves indistractable, if we call ourselves a certain moniker, that can help us stay on track. But we want to ask ourselves whether those labels are serving us, because many times they're not. They're self-defeating. Uh, and I think one of the things that I think we, we hear a lot today in the media is that technology technology is addicting everyone, that it's hijacking your brain, that it's, you know, making you do things. And not only is that scientifically not true, it's also not helpful. Because when we believe this, when we believe that we are the powerless to resist these distractions, it in fact becomes true. We stop trying, right? It's called learned helplessness. And so it actually, ironically, becomes more likely that these these limitations on our temper, on our uh, capabilities because of these self-limiting beliefs actually come to fruition because we make them true by believing that they're true. That's a really interesting point as far as those people that it, you know, it works for, the ego depletion. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy and the power right. of their beliefs are almost driving the, the bus on that. That's really interesting. That's right. That's right. And so we don't have to believe those things, right? There's nothing that says we have, like, even if you're, you are a morning person, let's say, okay, there's, you know, there's questionable research around that, but let's just say you believe you're a morning person. If you strictly adhere to that, well, what happens if you don't want to be a morning person? What happens if you would really prefer to get your workouts done in the morning? Or does that mean that you're, uh, or, sorry, in the evening? Or what, what, maybe, maybe you've got time in the afternoon that, what, do you just write off that time and say, oh, I'm a morning person, so I can't perform in the evening? That's not very helpful. That's not very productive. And so we want to make sure that these, these the, we're very careful about these labels because they really can backfire. Yeah, man, I guess a helpful way to think about that is just whether the belief or the idea is serving you or not. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Now, before we get to where folks can track you down on the interwebs near, is there anything that we didn't get to today around all this stuff that you'd like to leave my listeners with? No, that was fantastic. That was a great overview. I appreciate the questions. That was great. Awesome, man. So where can folks find the books, your social handles and all that good stuff? Sure. So my website is nearandfar.com. It's uh, spelled like my first name, N-I-R and far. So N-I-R and far.com. And if you go to the book website at indistractable.com, uh, there is an 80 page workbook that's complimentary. They can get there, that there, whether you buy the book or not. But if you do get the book, make sure you go visit the website and enter in your order number from no, no matter where you buy it. I will give you access to a free video course as well, all at indistractable.com. Awesome, man. I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thanks so much for coming on. That was a great chat. My pleasure. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Tons of useful tips in there. Now, one thing that really stuck out for me was the to-do list versus the calendar. I've had this experience where if I use a to-do list, I feel like it never fully gets done or complete because there are always tasks on my to-do list versus a calendar where everything has its own time slot. I've put it in, it's accounted for, and then at the end of that day I can relax because I know that those other tasks have their certain place in time where I'm gonna get them done. So I found that really useful, I hope you did too. Now I don't think I fully agree with Nir on the decision fatigue, ego depletion front. I do think that We tend to make poor decisions as the day goes on, as we get tired. I've just had so much personal experience with that for myself as well as with my clients. So I'm not fully sold on that, but I totally agree that it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that, oh, if I just tell myself I've got decision fatigue, so I'm going to have that bowl of ice cream or that bag of chips, that is a setup that doesn't serve you. I totally agree that that isn't a productive way of thinking in a sense, but I do think that decision fatigue does exist. I think that it's a real phenomenon. However, 
I think that the workaround there is to set yourself up for success. So if you know that you tend to make poor decisions food-wise towards the end of the day, I think that that's just a case to set up your food environment at home in a way that supports your goals rather than goes against your goals. Now, if you're interested in personalized one-on-one nutritional coaching or workout design, you can click the link in the show notes below or head over to n1fitness.com forward slash coaching. Also, follow me up on Instagram at n1fitness and Facebook at Marcus Sadu, as well as the N1 Fitness page. If you guys think that someone would find this episode useful, please do share it around. I think that especially at this time of year, folks are looking for strategies to implement healthier habits. And I think that this episode can help folks do that. So anyways, hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you next time. See ya.